Hi, I'm Jade Hernandez, a camouflage tattoo artist and educator. I help beauty bosses effectively market their business and become the authority in their field, close more leads and make more money. In the past six years, I've launched two successful beauty businesses to multiple six figures with over a hundred five-star raving reviews and several media press spotlights. While most marketers will tell you to hustle and work harder for success, I'll show you how to create more value from the inside out so that you work less, make more, and truly expand and transform your business and life. This is the Beauty Expanded Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back. In today's episode, I have a treat for you. This is my first episode where I'm interviewing and having a guest on this podcast. Her name is Carrie Hunt, and she is a permanent makeup artist and educator in Texas. I met Carrie because she was a past student of mine in camouflage tattoo training. She had already been doing camouflage tattooing, but just wanted to evolve her education and came out to Arizona to learn from me. And typically, I actually don't look into my students. I never check their Instagram unless they follow me. And then at that point, I'm all for supporting them and liking their photos and all of that stuff. But there was something about Carrie that really drew me to her. She had amazing energy, a really warm spirit that was very open and approachable. And I knew that she had a ton of experience and was already running a successful business. So she wasn't a new artist per se. And one night after my training, I did look into her Instagram and I was blown away with everything that she had done and was doing. She also has a podcast. It's called the Six Figure Beauty Boss Podcast, which will be in the show notes below. And it's amazing. I love her voice. I love her accent. I think you're also going to love her. And she shares a lot of the same things about how to run a successful business, how to make six figures, how to break into your PMU career. And so I would highly, highly suggest you take a listen to her as well because She is a supportive colleague in this industry, and she's an open book, which is so valuable in today's world. So after my training with Carrie, I just knew that she was someone that I wanted to stay in touch with. And when I thought about having a guest on my podcast, I really wanted to pick her brain. She has a passion for helping others. She has done over 8,000 permanent makeup procedures on clients all over the world. She's had a storefront location. Actually, she's had multiple locations, a team behind her, and she's also scaled down, which we'll dive into more in this episode. She's a wife, a mama of three, and she's the founder and CEO of The Brow Teak and Stella's Room. We dive into her humble beginnings and how she even started doing brows. The one thing I also love about Carrie is that she's very open and forthcoming about her relationship and faith to God. So whether or not you believe in God, the universe, or divine intelligence, it really doesn't matter because what I get from Carrie is that she is fully authentic in her own essence and what I would call an embodied entrepreneur. What I mean by that is that she's so much more than just an artist. She really brings forth her heart, her soul, and everything that she believes is right in the world in all of her marketing which is a very brave thing to do because things can be so what I would call PC. There will be parts of this episode, again, first time doing this, where our connection and microphone just got a bit staticky. And so there are parts where I will enter in and explain to you what was being said just because the audio quality was so poor. I think this is a great example that even though something is not perfect, If it's still 70% good, then it's good enough to post and publish. Just like previous episodes, I always say if you're looking for 100% perfection, you're going to be waiting for a really long time. Whereas my rule is as long as 70% of the content is still valuable and good, it's good enough. And that's perfect in itself to be able to post. So without further ado, let's dive in. Carrie, you've been in the permanent makeup industry for 10 years now. Are you guys planning on doing a celebration? 10 years is definitely something to be very proud of. Yes, I hadn't even really thought about it until me and my husband were talking about it. And we realized it had just been 10 years. And he was like, you have to do a party. And we didn't get to do a grand opening in the new building or anything because of COVID. So 
we're going to take advantage of it on Cinco de Mayo and have a Cinco de Mayo party. We're also launching the new name and branding and everything all at the same time. Very cool. And before you got into permanent makeup, you were doing medical sales, right? I was a nurse. Okay, so you were a nurse. Do you feel like 10 years, because I, I know from speaking from my own personal experience, I've only been in the industry for four years, but it has gone by so quickly. When I think about any other business that I've started in the past or worked in, it just seems like it was yesterday that I started. Because there's so much to learn in this industry, do you feel like 10 years does seem like a long time or what's your take on it? I feel like it does and it doesn't. Like sometimes I'm like, wow, I feel like I've been doing it forever for everything that I've been through. But then it is like you're saying it does really fly by like a flash because it takes years and years and years just to get a technique down. And just as soon as you get that, you want to add another one to the menu and then you start all over again. So I don't think you'll ever get to a point where you feel like, wow, I've made it. I know everything. Like, because I still get hard on myself every single day, even though it's been 10 years, I still feel like a new artist sometimes. Yes, I agree. I feel like tattooing is a really humbling experience. Just when you feel like you have perfected something, there's mm -hmm. always that variable of working on someone's skin and how they heal. And, ah. you know, there's always those complications that you just cannot guarantee perfection every time. Ah. So it is definitely a humbling experience. One of the things that I love about you is ever since I met you, you just had a really great, warm, open energy about you. I love your podcast and I'm so excited to share your podcast with my listeners as well. Just because I think in this industry, you definitely walk the talk. You are so connected, collaborative, so approachable. I know just even meeting you once during the training and being able to ask you questions about what you did to launch your podcast and anything else. I just feel like you're the type of person that I can literally send a DM, a text or a phone call and get information. And you're just so open and receptive to that. Would you say that that's something that's always been a part of who you are? And has that been reciprocated? to you from the very beginning or was this something that you started because you saw that there was a lack in the industry for that? So thank you first of all because that's a really good compliment. I think I've always been who I am and I don't think it was reciprocated for a very long time because 10 years ago nobody had even really heard of microblading and if they did it was only in New York, there was one in Beverly Hills. It was very 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 like you hadn't even heard about it. So when I was first doing my research and really needing a trainer, I couldn't find one or there was language barriers. Or if you found someone that spoke English, they weren't about to respond to you to give you any information, even though you were probably in a different state and sometimes a whole nother country. When I first decided to train, I wanted to be an open book. I think I put more pressure on myself as a trainer than I did as an artist, just because I had such terrible experiences with trainings. Probably the first three trainings that I actually went to, I felt like they were a waste of money. I felt like they weren't giving out any inside information. They were holding secrets and they just didn't want to give you those key elements that might make you a little bit better than them or up to the standard with them. And you just never felt like anybody was being open with you. So that was something that was really important to me. And I always wanted to be really honest. The first training I ever took, I remember asking my trainer and I really was just asking a question. I said, hey, I love the way that 3D microblading looks. Do you have any photos that I can see? I said, I was having a really hard time finding some of your work online. I would love to see some. And we were just chatting, sitting there waiting on and modeling them. And I remember her picking up her phone and scrolling for so long and she couldn't find one photo. It took her a very long time to find one photo. And I think that was like my aha moment of, oh no, I probably didn't do my research properly, which I didn't. I ran off of emotions and I found a trainer that was close and just signed up. And I actually had to borrow the money because we grew up super poor and I just never really had that kind of money. So $4,000 to me, I had to take out a loan and I was going to have to pay that money back. So I just remember that pit in my stomach of, wow, I'm going to have to pay this money back. And I didn't get valuable information. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can relate to that story as well. How long was it until you decided that you were ready to train? I think I was about four years in and it really hadn't even crossed my mind. I just started getting a lot of messages like, I would love to learn that. Would you teach me? And I started feeling pressure of that. 
I remember talking to my mom about it and she was like, well, just try it once. And if you don't like it, you don't ever have to do it again. So I tried it and I remember loving it so much. I never thought I could teach anybody anything. And it was really hard and it's definitely evolved. It's definitely gotten so much better. I can't imagine my students that were in my first class, but shout out to them. <laughs> but I, I did always put my whole heart into it. I can say that. And that's how I did it because we're bordering Oklahoma and Oklahoma laws are really, really, really strict for tattooing. A lot of the girls at first were pressuring me from Oklahoma. They really wanted to learn it, which was a bummer because it was illegal to tattoo in Oklahoma, period, whenever I first started training. So I had to turn a lot of them away. And then there was a lot of local girls too. And I remember people saying, how are you going to train somebody's local? Aren't you nervous that they're going to take over or whatever? And sometimes I would let that fear set in a little bit in the beginning. But what I realized was I've trained now for six years and I don't really consider any of them competition. I consider them my friends. I think that some of the students leave and think they're competition. I think that's like, sometimes you can feel a little bit of a different and maybe them for a while, a little competition, which I've never really felt that way. I love that. I absolutely agree with that. With your experience in education, you've been doing this for six years now, just from an educator standpoint, what are some commonalities or things that you've noticed that new artists do very well that leads them to success versus things that have hindered people from actually starting their PMU business after they've been trained? Thinking about this question, I would say I try to keep my classes pretty small. So six to eight students, eight would be pushing it and I would have a lot of help. But say I had six students, maybe two would be a good number that actually even tried, which was really hard for me to process in the beginning. It would make me think that maybe I wasn't a really good trainer. Or maybe I didn't equip them properly or maybe I didn't support them right. But it's true still today. I think it's gotten a little bit better now that I have a support group and I try to challenge them a little bit. I'll just share a story with you. So last year in one of my classes, I was like, how can I motivate them? Because I feel like it's really hard to get them motivated. They come in really high energy. They're so excited. They have a clear why, like they have a story on why they want to do it. And they're just so dead set. And then I can have them super motivated. I can have the whole room motivated by the time they leave. But something happens within those next few weeks where I think they either let life get too busy is a big part of it, or they are procrastinating, like self-sabotaging because they're so scared. I think it's just a huge fear because you're tattooing and a lot of factors go into it. And I think when they are working on the model and that's when they've had their first, oh my gosh, this is so hard. I think they have it on latex some, but then they're like, oh my gosh. They always sometimes have a story like, well, I got my eyebrows done and I just thought this would be fun. But I do think that one of the common denominators of what make people successful is coming from humble beginnings or really just having to like, it's like, I have to. For instance, if a young girl comes in and her dad walks in and pays for it and she just comes in, she might put her head down and not really pay attention as much and she'll never touch it again versus somebody who tells me they saved up all year and they don't really have a plan B. So if they don't have that, then I feel like that's their motivator. I've noticed the same thing too. Obviously everyone has that fear. It's very natural to feel a bit overwhelmed with everything that we learned. And because tattooing has that permanency factor into it, that's just going to amplify that fear that Obviously, the intention of doing good work is always there, but whether or not you have the confidence to do it and the right support to let you know that, you know, you can do this, I think that does begin to waver after they leave a training. And I would say same thing statistically, and I've shared this with you before, where it's a bit of that 80-20 rule where 20% of the students that I do train end up taking it further into a career versus 80% that may kind of double into it as a hobby and just let it go. But do you have any practical things that you're like, wow, that is one thing that I've noticed that really does help someone shift this into a career versus a false start? I haven't found the magic thing. I haven't found it. But back to what I tried last year, I did a challenge with two groups of my students. There was eight of them in here and they were all pumped up and it was like a group that was even more pumped than most people and they all did amazing and everybody did really good. So I said, 
I've got a challenge for you. And all of them were talking about signing up for my lip class. And this was a brow class. So I was like, how about I challenge you? And the winner, you know, wins a free lip class. And they were like, oh, okay, what is it? And I gave them four weeks. I said, okay, starting today, I'm going to give you four weeks to complete. I want you to map out 10 people, just do the steps on 10 different faces. And don't use an excuse that you don't know 10 people, because I know you're already going to think of that excuse. So if you know two people, do five on one person and five on the other and take photos and try to map them different ways. One might want thin, one might want thick and have different variables in there and take photos and let me know. So they needed 10 mappings and they had to do four front and back latexes and they already had the brow templates on them. So they just had to basically just tattoo on front and back of four, which is not very many. And I gave them a whole month. One person completed it. Wow. Yeah. Did all participate in the beginning and then one just ended up staying consistent and follow through? No, only one person participated. No, two participated on that first one, but didn't finish it. And one finished. And it was not the best work at all, but I had to gift her that because she did it. And she was like over the moon. She was like, I can't believe it. I've never won anything. I didn't have the heart to tell her that she was the only one that completed it. I couldn't crush her motivation, but I was proud of her for doing that. My point of it was by the time you get to the 10th person, it's going to be so much easier to you. The first time's not going to be very good. And then by the time you get to the 10th, you're going to understand it more. You're going to go through those steps. And then by the time you do 80 eyebrow sets, you're going to feel so good. And that's what I was trying to do. But I've done this twice. And both times, only one person has even done it. That is so interesting because as you're telling me this story, I love it. I feel that I could implement that (laughs) into my trainings. Yeah. But that is so interesting to me that it's still is a very low number of participation. And they couldn't have said that they forgot because I would cheer them on in my Facebook group. Like, don't forget, we are two weeks in. How's everybody doing? You know, kind of check on them. And then sometimes it would be crickets and then you could definitely see the dwindle down for sure. Yeah. I do understand that sometimes you get trained in something and then you realize that it's not what you thought it was going to be. I hear that a lot with lash artists because it's such a tedious procedure that once they get trained they didn't realize how tedious it was so do you think that that has something to do with brows too that maybe sometimes people get into it and then they realize oh this isn't what I thought it was going to be absolutely I had a girl two classes ago and when we got to doing my demo she stops and she says if I would have known that there was going to be any bleeding I would have never signed up for your class and I was pretty shocked because it was like just a little pinpoint. It was nothing. And you would think that spending that much money, they would do that research or kind of put two and two together. And so I was just like, wow, that was kind of like an aha moment. But I do hear all the time when we start drawing because I start on paper and then we move to the machine and then we move to real skin by the last day. And even on that first paper, they're already being so hard on themselves. They're already beating their self up. They're already comparing their drawings to my drawings. And I try to give them a pep talk about grace before we start. You didn't jump on a bike and ride it the way that you could today. I've been doing this for a really long time. It's completely different. Give yourself grace. They didn't expect it to be so hard. Got it. And you starting out when you first learned how to do brows, being back in the beginning artist's shoes, What helped motivate you to keep going? Honestly, I tell people this story all the time. If I would have owed that $4,000, I would have never done it again. I was that scared. I was already doing the negative talk in my mind. I was already telling myself, you're not an artist. You can't do this. You don't know how to run a business. But at the same time, I had to pay that money back. I had to figure it out. And my husband was excited. He was proud of me. So I was like, okay, I've got to figure this out. I had gotten a suite and I got four weeks free. It was their promo. And it was the littlest, tiniest room you've ever seen. I had a fluorescent light. It was just like a closet, basically. It was about $150 a week. And I told myself, if you cannot make $150 a week, then you are definitely in the wrong industry. I think it was good to hold me accountable because I never wanted my husband to have to pay it or somebody to have to pay it for me. Even if it was just that I made myself do two models or something, I was making myself do something so that I could pay that. 
And I think that was really good holding me accountable, just knowing that I had that. So I think a lot of people that drag their feet and don't ever completely set it up or get a room or do anything like that, they talk themselves out of it even more because they don't have any accountability. I tell people all the time, don't rush and go get a spot like mine. That would be crazy too. Just get something really small or something that you can afford, something that you can make sure that you can handle, even if it's just doing models. Don't overwhelm yourself on top of overwhelm. Because I was a terrible artist. I was a terrible, terrible artist in the beginning. I just happened to be the only one in Texas. It blew up really quickly. I remember I posted a picture of me tattooing on a piece of latex and all I was doing was drawing hair strokes. And I posted that on Facebook and literally my phone started blowing up and I was so scared because I was like, oh, now I have to do it. And I wasn't the best. I wouldn't say I was bad, but I definitely wasn't the best. I was a new artist, but my clients always knew I was going to do the right thing. I was going to take my time and I was going to treat them with love. And that's what I tell my students. As long as you treat them really, really good and you're leading from your heart, they're going to love you. They're going to come back to you. They're going to tell you what they don't like or what they do. You just have to get through that time. What kind of advice do you give to your students who feel that that's a roadblock, being a new artist? Because they have to start somewhere. I tell them to start with people that they know, that love them, and will be really easy on them. First, start off with basically not having any medical issues for sure, not having any old permanent makeup that they have to worry about not having compromised skin that they have to worry about. And just somebody that they know is just going to be so easy on them, not going to nitpick them. I say just be really picky at like who you use and just do your best. One thing that I always tell them to do too is don't have anything else pressing you that day. Just you and that person and take your time and walk yourself through all the steps. Take your time and have somebody that's easy on you, that knows they're going to the class, that already said they want to get it done. I wouldn't recommend doing anybody picky. I've had students that try to line up three or four in one day the next week, and that's a terrible idea. You don't know what's going to happen. You really just need that day for just that and that only. That way you have a good experience. Yes, I love that. And for someone who didn't have the advantage of being the only person in their town to start with microblading, mm -hmm. Because when I think about brows, a lot of people, and I'm sure you'll probably get phone calls from students who are thinking about training with you. One of the questions that I think someone would probably ask is, do you feel like the industry is too saturated? Do you feel like I can still make a career out of this? How do you answer that? The way that I answer it is it's saturated, maybe to some people. It really just depends on how you're looking at it. I use the analogy that I've been working where I work for years and I can walk across the street, sit down to eat lunch and somebody can ask me, what do you do? Oh, I've never heard of that. I get that all the time. And I've been doing it for 10 years in the same area. So I don't think that it's too saturated. I feel like there's room for everybody. And I think you're also going to develop your own style and your own technique and the people that are your people are going to gravitate towards you and the people that aren't your people are going to gravitate to somebody else. So you started as a singular artist and then you eventually got into a larger space and hired a group of permanent makeup artists to work under your brand, which I think is so awesome. But what a lot of people don't know if, if this is their first time meeting you is that you had launched your storefront right before the pandemic and you were $46,000 over budget as they were building it. And then the pandemic hit, so I'm assuming we were closed for X amount of time. How in the world did you keep your sanity and not throw in the towel? I think a lot of people would have broken at that point. I can only say my relationship with God is the only thing that got me through, honestly. I really leaned in on that. I had a lot of people, including my husband, tell me to back out of the new bill and there would be a way out because he's such a type A numbers guy. And yet, I just kept seeing how big my dream was for that studio. I had visualized that studio. I had thought about that studio for almost eight years. And I couldn't let it go, honestly. I would leave my house and go on walks and uh, my friends and get everybody's opinion and would come in and I would pray about it. Okay, so this is where things begin to get a little squirrely with a microphone. But Carrie goes on 
to talk about how she kept praying to God and connecting with him. She kept hearing him tell her consistently that everything was going to be okay and to keep pressing on. She also ends up cutting some of her budget with her architect. They had pivoted a couple of things to help get her building open and she spent some time during the pandemic to pour her energy into organizing the studio, getting everything properly set. And by the end of the year, not only did she meet her goal, but she had almost doubled her income. Did you always have a really close relationship with God even before you opened up your storefront? You know, it was almost there a little bit. It was very surface level. And I remember going to church with my grandma. I only went because nobody would go with her. It wasn't that my parents were super religious or spiritual. I really didn't see that in my personal household. I just saw that in my grandmother. I remember as I got older, starting to lean into that. Not a whole lot of people know this, but I was actually a drug addict for my teenage years into my early 20s. And I overdosed. And once I came out of that, it was like I clung to him more. And I really had to build onto that relationship to stay sober. I literally went clean and never touched anything again. And I think that was the beginning of my real relationship with God. Well, you're right. Like looking at you, you would never even know that that was something that you struggled with. Um, yeah. So then that's what really catapulted you to your relationship with him. And then obviously he's carried his presence in your life even to this day. So... You're in this pandemic, you're talking to God, you're like, I got this, I believe in this, I have faith. Then you open up and launch your business. But at that point, did you start the hiring process or were you already doing the hiring process? Did you already have a team in place? I already had a growing, thriving team. I already had two locations. We were basically building out our dream location and having faith to pour more money into it and really make it official because... When I first started, I thought it was going to be some type of hobby. I thought it was going to give me some spending money. I didn't really think of it as a business. So I was like, okay, I'm going to stop being scared. I'm going to sign the five-year lease. I'm going to put my all into it. I already had that team and I was so excited coming back for the pandemic because I had missed them and I had sisters working for me. I thought we were all really, really great friends. Everybody was making six figures. Every single person was making six figures. I didn't think there was anything that anybody could have complained about. Everything seemed so good other than the fact that we were so busy, which was a good thing. And I was finally getting all of my clients to trust that if they're on my team, that they were good. And we all shared clients. So it could have been my client from five years ago and they could refresh everything for them. I was trying to make it non-competitive and more like a team. So I thought everything was moving along great. I couldn't have visualized anything going the way that it did last year, but I started noticing shifts in energy and just feelings that I was getting when I would walk in the room. I would feel an energy shift and I wouldn't really understand it. I would pull my team aside and just ask, is everything okay? We would have team meetings. I would say, this is your time also to speak up if I could do anything better. I'm just learning just like you guys are learning. And the answer was always the same, which was no, you couldn't do anything different. I'm so happy. Everything's great. So it was starting to make me feel like I was crazy. I can be super sensitive. I really started bringing God into my business more. Carrie goes on to say that she had two different relationships with God. One was at home. And then when it came to her business, it was completely different. But once she started bringing God more into her business, that's when things began to reveal itself in ways that she couldn't describe or justify in any other sense. Truths came out, everything came out to light, that she wasn't crazy, that she wasn't making these things up in her mind, but that her employees were unhappy. When you pray, do you actually hear him speak to you? Or do you ask him a question and then you just give it time and space to manifest into whatever it needs to be? I feel like a lot of times I pray and I give it space. I can hear him. Sometimes I can hear him so clear, it's scary. And I think that only came with pouring him into all my day-to-day, -day, pouring him everywhere and being consistent. When he would say something to me, it was so clear and so profound that I couldn't even argue. People ask me all the time, how do you know if it's mind chatter or if it's God? And the main filter you could put that through, is it negative or is it positive? Is it for you or is it something that's fear-based? 
or something negative. That's the main easiest thing that you can do. If it's negative, that's not his voice. That's you being hard on yourself. I never thought that my business would take on that life that it did. I never wanted it, but I do feel ego got pulled into it. I was like, ooh, look at my team and look how much I've done and all that. Because I did grow up so poor and I did get bullied in school and I did get called like trash or whatever. So I think I was like, ooh, but look at me and look at all, you know, this beautiful team and look what I did. So I really feel like when I stripped all that away and really prayed and asked, I don't really want all that. I don't really care. Does anybody even really care? Is it fun to me anymore? And it wasn't fun to me anymore. It was taking the joy out of work. The money wasn't worth it. I, I finally started asking myself, if I could get rid of all this stress, would I miss the money? And the answer was no. I would rather enjoy my children and be clear headed and be happy and be surrounded by people that I know love me and want to be around me. That's what I want. So I remember one day, I sat here and I prayed and I left and I was driving home and I was really asking for guidance and clarity. And whenever I was driving, I felt like God said, what do you have to prove? Who are you trying to prove yourself to? So true. You don't have anything to prove. And that sounds so silly. I feel like right now and so simple, but when I heard it, I was like, huh, I don't know, really. I don't know who I am trying to prove anything to. Then I started asking myself questions. And I remember where I was. I remember the stop sign I was at. I remember I was in my neighborhood. I was very close to home. And I remember going, I don't know. And then I started saying, well, am I trying to prove it to him? Well, no, I don't have anything to prove to him. Am I trying to prove it to myself? Well, no, not really. Maybe a little bit, but am I trying to prove it to social media? That seems really dumb to kill yourself and go through all this stress for social media. So when I walked in my house and I went in, my husband worked from home and I went in his office and I sat down, which I never really interrupted him. And I said, I'm quitting. I'm letting my team go. In his face, it was like he saw a ghost. It was like, what? No, you're not. But he had never heard me ever in 16 years at her. I quit because I always figure a way out. I always find a way. The one word that he always uses to describe me is relentless, and that's so true. I'll figure anything out. But when he saw me say, I'm done, and I was like, I heard it very clearly. I've been praying about this for a really long time. I feel like I just got the word, and that's what I'm going to do. And then I still struggled, even though I knew I was making the right decision. I kept praying, give me a sign in case I'm doing the wrong thing. I started doing things like that. and. He hit me over the head like one more time and seriously broke my heart to be like, this is what you're missing. And everything made sense after that. Once I realized the part that I was missing and the truth, which was basically just what was being said about me, just happened to be in a moment where somebody heard it and relayed the information to me, didn't have any ill intentions, actually didn't even relay the information to me. They relayed the information to one of my friends and then she relayed to me. So it wasn't like she was trying to gossip. And the way that it all came around full circle, I was like, Oh my gosh, he showed me. I was stunned because I knew it. And it was the easiest decision that I ever made. I never looked back. When I think about it now, I really did kill myself for years trying to prove myself the, the weight that was lifted off my shoulders. And I think that just brought me even closer to God. So anytime something like that happens, I feel like he loves us in, in those valleys. You know what I mean? Like, he loves the valleys. So now I'm like, bring me to the valley because that's where I grow leaps and bounds. I don't even care about being on the mountain anymore. It's nice, but bring the valleys on because once I came out of that, the past six months after that, I don't even recognize that girl. And yeah. the listeners that are listening, you can go to Carrie's podcast, which I highly suggest you do. But she sure. does an entire episode of how she ended up letting go all of her employees and closing up shop and and basically taking a really big business and scaled it down to just you and your mom, right? Or do you have any other artists working for you? I have one apprentice now because I still had that little yearning in me to see if I did it differently, how the new Carrie would do it. Yeah. Would it actually look different? Would it run differently? Well, that's my next question, Carrie. If you were to hire other artists again, what would you do differently? When I think about scaling my business, and having other artists camouflage for me. How do I even begin to transition that? Because it's such a personal thing, just like brows. 
And what do you do when people are like, no, I only want you to do it? How do you get good artists in there? Because I've had assistants. So I've, I've had a couple assistants. I have one currently. and She's amazing. But one thing that I've noticed as an employer, and I actually think I'm a great employer. I'm generous. I pay well. I'm respectful of time, freedom, all that stuff. But I realize that that those things may not always be things that other people value. And how do you even begin to scale outside of yourself? So I have a really good friend and she has a beauty business and she has almost 20 employees. We got really microscopic. We took all these notes when I was even thinking about letting everybody go. And she was trying to show me what I should have done differently. How could I have done it better? And maybe how I could spend that to my team that I had then and kind of just change everything. But I was too far with my team in the way that they, they had already worked for me for years. They had been with me for a really long time. And we had two meetings before I ended up calling it quits to see if we could salvage or see if there was something that I could do. Because I was really having a hard time thinking that they relied on me. So... We had a couple of meetings and I was pitching these things that my coach was telling me that I should do differently. And she was like, it will be hard, but if you could get them on board, everybody would be happier. Because when I first hired, I was too generous. I put their commission rate up way too high so that they didn't have anywhere to grow. There was no motivation. And I taught them everything I knew right out of the gate whenever I thought they were ready. Brows, lips, eyeliner, lash lifts, anything you could imagine. I was an open book and they were independent contractors also. So she was like, you need to see if you can move everybody to be an employee. And that way they're going to have short-term disability. They're going to have their taxes paid. Really explain to them all of these benefits. If they were to go and break an arm or whatever, they would be covered. These are things that they wouldn't be able to do if they were an independent contractor. But also, you're going to pay part of their taxes and they're going to pay part of their taxes. She's like, it is an expense, but you do have more say-so if you needed something for them. If you wanted to tell them what you thought was okay for them to wear versus what they thought was appropriate. And it could be something as small as me saying, I want us to all wear scrubs or us to all wear black. If they walked in and rolled out of bed in a 3X t-shirt with their hair not combed from the night before and sleep in their eyes, and I have clients that are sitting on the couch that had flown in, and I thought that was inappropriate, I couldn't really say that because they were independent contractors. I had basically lost all control, and I was already paying them capped out. I was already paying them above industry standard. I wanted to pay them above that so that they were so happy they never wanted to leave me, you know. So they didn't think, oh, I could make so much more if I did this on my own. I didn't want to be cheap. I wanted them to get the benefits and make six figures and change their life the way that it had changed mine because this industry changed my life. So I wanted to make sure that they felt they were making those changes with their families too and were be able to stay home with their kids more and all that. And I just thought that they would naturally appreciate me for that. But it backfired on me. They didn't really put me on the level that I felt like I needed to be as a leader because they saw me as a peer. I have a really hard time saying exactly what you have to do or anything like that. I would definitely change that. They would be an employee. I would start them off lower and I would only teach them one technique at a time and have a structure where they earn that. So basically they have a goal. You're going to post three times a week. You're going to get this many reviews and you're not going to get any complaints. And when you can do that six months in a row, then I'll give you a commission increase and I'll give you a Saturday off and you can learn a new technique. Yeah. That's kind of how I'm doing it now. And she's so goal motivated. Like my girls never had that. It was really my fault. Well, you live and you learn, right? Because I think I would have done it the way that you did. But now you've expanded my perception of, okay, like if I were to scale and actually hire, maybe I do need to look into the employee status versus independent contractor. I would have done it exactly the same way you did in the very beginning. So as an employee, they would still have the potential to make commission as well. Yeah, so I hired this apprentice. I couldn't get rid of that feeling that I had for so long of wanting to try it over again because I had already done all that legwork. And then when we had those meetings and I realized they were not going to budge on any of that, they were not going for it. And one of the girls even said, you really just spoiled us too bad. I don't think I could go backwards. 
And she said it multiple times. And it was the truth. I would buy lunch a lot of times. I would overpay. I just wanted them to be happy. And I think you have to really set that tone and the expectation and they respect you for that. I've been doing it now since October with a girl and it's worked so, 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 so well. What I did was I started off paying her hourly and just taught her one technique. I told her also, which I had never, ever, ever done with my girls. I told her she had to do 30 models and she had to find them. And that took the pressure off of me feeling like, well, I got her this person. Like, what if they're not happy? What if they're mad at me? Which was what would happen when I was training other girls. I would do a model call. And if something didn't go right, I was doing a correction. Or they then became my client. And that wasn't what I was doing. So I challenged her and said, I want you to do 30 clients. I really wanted her to learn how to find those people on her own and how to do that work. And I was paying her hourly and she was learning and I was watching her timing and she was giving me all of her photos and notes that I would give her feedback. I would probably would have used this color maybe instead. And every single time we did that, she would correct something and she would get better. And she's completed all of them now and she's really, really good. And she did them all on her own, which told me she had hustle and she had heart and it didn't have everything be done for her. That's awesome. I love that. So she's still with you. Yeah, she hit her first goal. And she learned lips a few weeks ago. So now she's starting that process over on the lip part. But I put her as a brow artist on my website and on my booking link. And she's just a good lower cost option. If somebody goes and they're like, wow, Carrie, I can't afford that. But they can afford her and they might be willing to do that. And then a lot of people don't want to wait. And a lot of people call and say, I don't really care who does them. Some people aren't picky and don't care. And then some people want the most expensive and they want to wait. I think it's good to have those two options. That was actually really helpful for me to hear. What did you do to confront that pushback of, no, I only want you to do it, Carrie? Or is that just in my head and that didn't really happen? No, it really did happen. <laughs> it really did happen. And when people would say that, well, see, I tested it out first and I did it all wrong. So I basically was going to have my apprentice do all of my follow-ups because the work will be there. It'll give her great practice. But then the clients were so uncomfortable and stunned. That's not what they wanted. And sometimes it was uncomfortable situations. So I don't like to do that now. I just tell my clients when they call. My friend does just says exactly the truth. Carrie is booked out until June and her price is $850. Or we have this person and she's already done plenty of people. She works right beside Carrie. She has available two months earlier and she's actually only $450 right now. So it cuts the ball in their court, and then they get to make that decision. We're not pushing them into that decision. And I feel like it's 50-50. Some people want to, and some people really don't care. And some people just trust me. Some people say, I've been coming to carry for a really long time. I just need a refresh. And I think it just comes with time. I think you'll get a lot of pushback in the beginning. But then as people get used to it, they stop saying that anymore. And if they want to wait, then they'll wait for you, you know, and if they don't, then they'll go with your person. It'll be a win-win. I can see that it gives them more flexibility and just more options. And I think that's always a good thing. The other question I had for you, Bay, was, so speaking about booking with you, what I find really interesting, you just open up your books once a month. Is that how you do it? Because I want to get really clear on how you do it because it's so unique. And I know that you love it. You've already mentioned that you'll never go back to how you used to do it. Share a little bit more of how people actually book with you today. So everything I've done in 10 years has always been trial and error. And this was just the thought that I had. I had seen a few people that I'm friends with in my industry do this. I had seen them announce their booking day. And I, I remember years back always thinking, what? That seems so crazy. Why are they doing that? And I started thinking about it and I told my mom, cause my mom handles a lot of my admin and my books and my phone and all that. I said, okay, we're going to test something out and just bear with me. She always gives me pushback. She was like, no, what if they don't wait? Or what if they go somewhere else or whatever? I'm like, it'll be okay. It'll be fine. So what I basically do Jade is, so yesterday was the first of the month. I opened for two months from then. So say it was March 1st, I opened May. Okay. Following? Yep. Because all of my follow-ups are done around eight weeks. So that gives me time to estimate how much time I'm going to need to block off for follow-ups. 
I had never really understood why I couldn't get a handle on my schedule. At least five or six years, I've said things like, I'm not going to work past three o'clock. I'm only going to work four days. And it will never, ever, ever pan out. And I could not figure out why. And actually what it was is I was leaving my books open all the time. And I was kind of doing it by my goal. My goal was what was open. But then I would always have VIP clients. I say it's VIP clients. It's the clients that if they messaged me, they've been with me for eight years, they know I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to find them a spot. And some of them I just love dearly. They're some of my really good friends. I'm not going to tell them, oh, well, wait till whatever. I'm always going to quote unquote, squeeze them in. I'm always going to have VIP clients. And I'm always going to have follow-ups, right? We can always bank on that. We're always going to have that. Then we're going to have reschedules. And then what if my kids get sick one day? Then I'm going to pay for it. Or what if we have a bad weather day or something like that? So something's always going to come up. And it might just be clients that had to reschedule. We saw that during COVID. People were rescheduling like crazy. The first time I went in there and I just estimated, I went back and I was like, okay, how many new clients do I have this month? What do I need to lock off in my mind? I went on and I estimated and I opened what I thought would be a good buffer to open for new clients or refreshes. And I never let follow-ups book online. I always have to book those. That's closed off. So I started there. All I did was I posted about it maybe two times and I sent an email marketing blast out to all of my email lists. It basically said the the book's open and my mom had been telling people for weeks, her books are closed, but call back on the first and you can get an appointment. She's going to open them at 8 a.m. And what happened was it created so much excitement and momentum and it caught on really, really fast. So the first time I opened it at 8 a.m., I think it took maybe 30 minutes and the whole month was booked. No way. The whole month was booked. Yes. And then I had room in there. I felt like I could breathe. I felt like if somebody that I loved messaged me and said, I would love to get my lips done before my daughter's wedding in six weeks. Is there any way I could do it? I had buffers in there that I could do it without. I was going to say yes regardless. So it's either am I going to do it in a healthy manner or am I going to do it staying from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock or something like that. It was so cool. I was so nervous because what if 8 o'clock strikes and I've been holding my books hostage and nothing happens? And it filled up really fast. People were calling us. There was little quirks. People were mad at us technical wise or the system. They couldn't see it properly. They were calling like crazy back to back to back. Now everybody's ready. They have their alarms on. My older women that have issues online. I'm like, hey, I opened up a little bit early. And it gives my front desk a break. We're not booking all the time. Something else that I noticed was nobody cancels anymore. I never get a cancel anymore. The best thing about it, Jade, was I get to block my kids stuff off first. I get to pull their calendar for school. If it's an in-service day, if it's a day they get out early, if it's their breaks, if it's even a class party or something like that, I'll go through their emails and I'll go through the calendar and I'll block those off first. And then I'll block time off for my husband. Then I'll block some me time off. If it's something like, oh, I think I want to start yoga. I might want to start late this month and I want to try something different. I'm not cornered forever and feel like I don't have any control over my life. And this is the first time ever that I've been able to be present at my kids' class parties or field trips. That was worth everything to me. And you get a little bonus the first of the month. This is going to sound really weird, but just from all the deposits from one booking day, I pay my whole rent. It's due on the first of the month. Amazing. So I take that and I just pay my rent and then... We're smooth filling and I can actually put my trainings in. I just feel so much more organized and clear headed. That feels like the ultimate balance. I think you got it down that work life balance and being able to prioritize what you really value. It sounds like one of your highest priorities is your kids and your husband and family. So being able to make sure that you put that in the calendar before work overrides everything. What's your deposit policy? My deposit policy is no refunds. Okay. And what is your deposit? So my deposit is a percentage of 20%. And the no refund policy actually explains why, again, someone would second guess if they did want to cancel on you because not only are they losing their slot for two months, but they're also losing their deposit. 
Yes, because for years I didn't have that policy. I had a 72 hour. As long as you let me know for 72 hours, I would either give you a refund back or I could transfer it or whatever. And it just got so crazy. Some people that were maybe even wanting to cancel and not do it at all would move it right before the 72. They might move it for a month from now and then wait a week and then cancel it and get their money back. Sometimes they would take up time block two, three, four times and then get their money back. And it didn't feel fair to me. I thought, well, if they want it, they're going to invest that. It's usually about a hundred and something dollars typically maybe 200 at the most, but I think it has to be significant enough for them to really think about it, you know? Yeah. And now that you've been doing this new booking system, you won't go back, I'm assuming. I would never go back. Yeah. Never go back because think about it. My May is booked now. What about in June? What if I'm like, I want to completely change my schedule for summertime for my kids, which I've never done. Maybe I become a yogi and they only do yoga at 10 a.m. or something like that. I can change. I think we got to give ourselves room to become that new person. Yes. Thank you so much for taking the time out today to share your story to me and all my listeners. In the show notes, I'll be sure to share where they can find you and follow you. I know we didn't have much time today to talk about your academy, but for those that are listening, Carrie is about to launch. Yeah, it's launching the end of this week. Awesome. So by the time you listen to this podcast, it will have already been launched. She's been working on this online PMU Academy. For those of you who want to learn at your own pace, I know everything that Carrie does is extremely thoughtful and intentional. And so even though I haven't seen the Academy, I am sure it's everything that she's wanted it to be and that it's extremely informative and supportive. Please check her out. And then before we end the episode, is there anything else you would like to say? I just want to say thank you for having me here. This was so much fun. I'm so excited that you thought about me to come do your interview. I know it was your first interview and I'm so grateful that you even let me come here. And you were such a great teacher, Jade. I just really, really respect everything, especially for just your four years. I feel like you're so knowledgeable and you do everything. You inspired me whenever I was in your studio. I was like, wow, you really, really motivated me whenever I was there to just be better too. So I thought you were really thoughtful and it seems like you're super balanced. Am I right? No, 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 no. I have been inspired by you today and I actually have always been inspired by you because when I think about you being a successful business owner and an educator and a mom and a wife, I actually really look up to you for that freedom because I love when I reach out to you and you're like, oh, I'm taking the month off or I'm taking the weekend off to go to Sedona. And I'm like, wow, I need to tap into that more. That's one of the things to be fully transparent that I'm working on this year is to not have my business run me. The interesting thing is is business is one of my top values and priorities, but it can't be my only thing. That's where I'm learning how to bridge the family the self-care, the solitude, so that I can be a better artist and live a more fulfilling life and not be burnt out. I'm going to take your advice. I'm going to keep watching you, keep following you. And I'm sure as I have questions about how to step away from my business and trust that it will all work and still be there, I'll be coming to you for more advice. I'm an open book. I love that. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much. And I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'd love to connect and help you more. If you have a question you'd like for me to answer, please send it to jade at studioconceal.com. That's J-A-Y-D at studioconceal.com. And I might highlight it on my podcast. I find what's often personal is most general. So if this episode helped you, please share it with a friend who may need the encouragement and inspiration. I'll catch you on the next one.